Welcome to another exciting edition. And Father John, why don't you outline some of the questions we are going to be uh, doing in this show today? Well, one question we're looking at, why was St. Zachariah punished? Why? And especially if he's a saint. That's right? correct. Okay. And what did he do? Hmm. Another question, is praying in tongues real? Didn't you say it belongs to one of the gifts and there's a real technical term for that, which I would never get, but you will always... Get. Yes. Well, it, the question is, is it real or is it fake? Right. We shall see. And for that technical term, stay tuned. And did the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph ever have to discipline our Divine Savior? Hmm. Like saying no or... Yes. Okay. Let's wait and find out. And finally, there was a time when men wore suits and women wore hats to church. What happened? You mean flip-flops and sweatpants <laughs> are not the norm back then? They weren't the original. Okay. That's for sure. Well, for these questions to be answered, stay tuned. Hello, and welcome to another episode <laughs> of Web of A 2.1 and a half. Father John's been sharing some humorous <laughs> jokes before our episode here today. We just enjoy being here. <laughs> yes, we do. And uh, this is based on our regular series 2.0, which can be found on EWTN on Saturday night's Eastern Standard Time. My name is Father Kenneth Brigenti, pastor of St. Magdalene's here in Flemington, New Jersey, in the Diocese of Metuchen. And I am joined by my very humorous <laughs> co-host... Yes, <laughs> I'm choking to death. Uh, Father John Trujillo of the Diocese of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Director of Pastoral Formation at Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. So we uh, welcome you to this uh, series, and the way it works is you send in some questions, and we try to answer them for you in a timely fashion on this series. So we have uh, some from last week already that we didn't finish, so we're going to do those t today. And... Uh, but we're open for the rest of the week if you want to send some questions in. Uh, we got one over the weekend, and we will do that probably tomorrow. But uh, please feel free to send them in. Uh, we were just I was just telling Father Tregilio that this is how many we've already answered. We can write another That's book. That's a lot of trees. We could really write another book, you know? <laughs> That's so, not Laudato C. Si. <laughs> and uh, Father Matthew is just, that's right. Father Matthew was saying that this is the episode 52. So, you know, if you look at all these episodes that we've done, you basically have the catechism right there, but of course done in a very uh, interesting and entertaining way, especially when you have a co-host like Father Tregilio. So, uh, so anyways, let's get started. Okay, I, I got, for me, I got right? one for you, yes. Is it a Lulu? Uh, and maybe a, a Betty Lou. All right. Dear Father, I truly enjoy the elegance you have brought to the liturgies. Thank you. You really raise the bar and not the one you drink at. <laughs> but I've noticed people dress like they just flopped out of bed. So have we. At one time, women had to wear hats and men wore suits. What happened? It doesn't matter what I wear. And that's Cynthia from Lawrenceville. I presume that's New Jersey. Yes, it is. It's not too far from us, actually. It's uh, just outside of Princeton. Uh, anyways, uh, you know, it, the, the church also doesn't live in a bubble. So as you know, in society in general, uh, dressing mores have uh, changed over the last 60 years. So if you look at a TV show from the 1960s, you see how formally everybody dressed. Even the children, when they were playing outside, uh, the little girls were wearing little dresses and boys were uh, wearing shoes, not so much sneakers, and they were all pretty neat and clean. But um, then what happened was the sexual revolution and everything just went south. You know, hippies came in, long <laughs> hair, and, you know, uh, Catholic still, schools still kept up. You know, you had, I remember going, um, sister would measure the hair on your collar there, and if you didn't get it cut by a barber, she'd cut it for you. And they also you. measured the length of the girl's skirt. Right. Uh, that's true. Uh, and, you know, the uniforms had to be neat and clean, but, you know, that was Catholic school. Uh, so uh, the rest of society was really basically imploding. And it's so interesting, you know, we have more uh, um, income now than we did 60 years ago. Uh, clothes are a lot less expensive now than they were 60 years ago. Uh, and people buy a lot more clothes uh, they do now than they did 60 years ago. Usually, I remember I had my uniform for school. I had play clothes for the yard, and we had Sunday uh, clothes that my mother would get for me at Christmas time and Easter because you would grow out of them by Easter time. So those were the two times of the year that we normally would get uh, Sunday best clothes. 
And uh, but as uh, families started to break down and society started to break down, uh, you also see that in in their dress too. And you know, when you dress, it's not just for yourself, but it's really a sign of respect in many different ways uh, for the other person. Uh, I care enough to keep myself and my appearance nice and neat and clean for the other person uh, as well. Now, in areas of church, um, um, they did relax the rules about women wearing head covering, so they did not have to wear a hat <clears throat> or a veil, etc. But I don't know where they went from not wearing a hat and veil to wearing sweatpants. That <laughs> that just was something that was not uh, uh uh, in any book that I ever read, uh, from the, <laughs> when they relax the rules on, on how to dress. So, uh, it's always appropriate to dress, uh, and you have to define what Sunday best is now because you can't just assume it. But you're, you know, you're, you're trying to raise the bar for your children. And we have a wonderful friend who just told us this Saturday that during this COVID that they try to make it, uh, the eight o'clock taped mass that they watch together as much as like a Sunday. So they all dress up the in their wife, home, in their home, in the living room. The wife puts on a dress. He says he puts on his vest and tie, and the and the children do too. And then they get ready and what they watch mass as though it was like an uh, as though they were going to church. So here's a family that's still keeping that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, is it better to um, uh, uh, just to be at mass and not at all? Well, of course, if you can't afford it and you don't have the money and you don't uh, have the, the clothing, absolutely, it's more important to be at Mass. But it's not a either-or situation. It could be a both-and. Normally, if you look in someone's closet, there's lots of clothes in there. It's just you just chose, don't choose to wear them uh, uh, for Mass because Mass has to be for you, your source and your summit of your Christian life for the week. It's something that you plan, and it's an event. You just don't arrive there. You should be preparing yourself during the week. Padre Pio said, you know, the first part of the week is in Thanksgiving from the Mass that you attended on Sunday. The second part of the Mass uh, or the week should be in preparation for the next one. And that could be spiritually as well, where you read the Scriptures for Sunday and you try to enter into uh, the liturgy uh, besides your private prayer life. And also physically as well as how you dress and how you purport yourself in church. So um, those around you may not be uh, f uh, following that rule, but you could start the trend and bring it back. Whatever the case is, modesty has always been the rule. So you should never dress in modest in, in when you're going to church. And what does might be immodest? Well, cut off shorts and uh, blouses that show a little bit too much uh, of, uh, of 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 yourself, uh, you know, things of that nature. You know, uh, first of all, there's other people that you have to custody of the eyes that they have to to worry about, and you should also have uh, that you're in the in the house of the king, which is the Lord Jesus. So you want to dress your best. Remember the wedding feast, of the banquet. Yes. Um, and, and the wedding uh, garment. The wedding garment. I'll let you go on that one, Father. It's good. Well, yeah, that's a beautiful story in He's the gospel <laughs> that, uh, you know, the man was thrown out, even though he was invited the last minute, and uh, he didn't have the proper wedding garment. And people say, oh, is that terrible? He was invited the last minute. What people forget is what was at the time of Christ, everyone had a wedding garment. You wore it at weddings. It was a sign of respect. So the fact that even if you were invited the last minute, that you didn't go back home and get it, and you wore it. it. Didn't matter how much it cost. It was that that was the proper attire for a wedding. So the man showed disrespect, and that's why he was thrown out. Now uh, I had a sign at my parish, very blatantly on there: "Please dress mod modestly, speak quietly, and act properly." And uh, not always people would obey that. And as Father Brigenti said, you know, you don't want to be an occasion of sin, nor do you want to be an occasion of disgust. Because some of these people who do dress immodestly don't have the body for it to be uh, an occasion of sin to begin with. Uh, so dress modestly. And uh, I, I can give you one other point here. A lot of these clothes that people wear that look horrible and trashy, they, caught, they, pay, they pay more money for that than for a nice pair of slacks and a button-down shirt. The, the blue jeans now that have holes in them, yeah, I was gonna chuckle they, on they that cause... pay twice or three times as much for a regular suit, I, I remember as a kid when we had those uh, those trousers that had oh, yeah. holes in it. My our brothers didn't patch them. They said that's time we throw them out. 
And, and they were embarrassed if you wore that in public. Because, yeah, it, uh, but now it's a, a whole different era. It's but unbelievable. In church, you should still dress as though you were going to... Business, business casual, at least, I say. That's right. You have to explain what that is now. Yeah, you know? because in uh, the old days, they had formal wear. And I'll, I'll tell you this. One summer, I worked uh, as a priest in, in a um, poor parish in Erie, uh, it was uh, like 80% African American. It was about 15% Latino and then 5% Hungarian. Every Sunday, uh, particularly the African Americans would dress to the nines, as they would say. The woman wore these wonderful uh, hats and gloves. The men, every single man there That's wore true. a jacket and a tie. And that, those were their Sunday clothes. And a lot of them were on fixed income, but uh, they would come to church early. They would stay late. And they were always dressed because that was the highlight of their week. And then you go to one of these suburban parishes, uh, and they would they would wear t-shirts, uh, sweatshirts, flip flops, um, sleeveless shirts. And to this day, when you go to Rome or you go to Hansville, the Mother Angelica's place, if you're wearing shorts or a sleeveless shirt, they have something that you have to put on over that. And uh, and people Americans go to Rome or they go to Hansville. Oh, that's not right. Yes, it is. Because, uh, you know, you're expected to dress appropriately. So I say as a bare minimum, uh, what, what, what typically they call a business casual these days. And you can look that up because that's defined differently in, in, in different countries. But mostly it's, you know, what you would wear at work, uh, normally speaking. It's not the full formal where you have to wear a black tie and tails or even that you have to wear a suit jacket. But something that's appropriate for church. Right. And, um, and it just shows respect for the Lord. And uh, that's what you're dressing now, for. Obviously, there is those who cannot afford it very rarely. I mean, usually parishes have lots of social concerns that can help people out. But the point is not so much the money. The point is, what do I choose to do? And, and I think that is the problem. And it's sometimes it's because we forget why we're there and who we're worshiping. We're forgetting that we're worshiping God. And, um, and so if we're worshiping God, don't you want to put your best foot forward? Well, we I mean, we ran a clothing having, bank. You wouldn't think of having somebody of an importance no. over to your home and not prepare. Uh, you would you would you would not only prepare your home, uh, but you would all and prepare the meal. But you will also look nice yourself uh, because you're hosting a dignitary, someone very special. Uh, maybe there'll be a photo op even. So when you're coming to mass, you're worshiping God. So shouldn't he get the same? type of respect as you would show any dignitary in your home. Um, so the question is what I believe and and do I believe? And if I do, then I'm going to put my best foot forward. And here's something that's even the obscene perversion of this. Uh, we remember in, in New York City, people would come to a wedding dressed in their ultra casual floppy oh, let's just say it. sloppy rollers clothes. and a house coat they would right. dress <laughs> disgustingly but and then they go away. home and dress up in their best clothes for the reception right and they would look like totally different people you know and we say wow is this the same one that was with the rollers and the house dress at the mass shame so where are my priorities and how am i preparing for mass and how do I get into that? Do I make it an event like John Paul II in Dies Domines, yeah. uh, the Day of the Lord? He says, do I make this the special event with my family? And if I do, and there are families here that you, you could see that this becomes an event for them, the way they come to Mass, the way they, a little bit early, you know, they light a candle, they'll spend some time in prayer, uh, they themselves deport themselves the way they dress. Um, their kids and them are knowing that this is something very important. But if you're just at a flop there, the message you're sending to your kids, first of all, is this doesn't really mean much. And second of all, it doesn't mean much to me. And third, where's my faith in this? So um, so raise the bar. Uh, we, the clergy do. Uh, we always try to look presentable and have good, clean vestments. And, 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 and the church is to be uh, as well appointed as we can. So now you need to raise the bar as well. It's a sign and expression, a visible sign and expression of who you believe is at Mass, the Lord. Okay. Well, we have one for you. Um, dear Father uh, John, thank you for all you do. God bless you for the show and for your holy Masses. My question is, why is St. Zachariah punished for asking the Archangel Gabriel, 
How can his wife, St. Elizabeth, become pregnant? Well, the Blessed Mother asked the same question. How can this be, since I know not man? And she is not reprimanded. So this is Priscilla from Piscataway. Oh, Priscilla. Well, that is a good question, because at first glance, it would seem there's double standard. But you have to look at it in its context. Remember, always the text must be taken in context. So, yes, both Zechariah and the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, ask, how can this be? But Zechariah asks it in a sarcastic way, and that's the key here. Because when the angel says you're gonna, your wife's going to give a, have a child, his response is not, oh, how can this happen? So it's more a, like, how could this be? My, my wife's too old. So he's more like he doesn't believe it. That's right. He has, his, his is he more. how it's going to figure all yeah, out. He's, he's coming with the He's being a smart that, aleck, exactly. okay? And whereas the Blessed Mother asks it in innocence. She says, how can this be since I know that man? So when I was explaining this in, in a homiletics class, I said, now when you're reading it, that's what you want to convey. You want to convey the part of Zechariah going, how can this be? Whereas with the Blessed Mother is, how can this happen? So Mary's, her incredulity is not a questioning of her faith. She's merely stating a fact that she doesn't understand because she's not yet married to St. Joseph. Whereas Zechariah, he's sort of, you know, rubbing in the nose of the angel, almost like when um, Abraham uh, and um, Sarah and the angels, you know, visit him and say, you know, your wife's going to have a baby. And she sort of disparages, she says, well, how can that happen? I'm, I'm too old for that. And they end up naming uh, their, their, their child um, Isaac, which means God laughs, okay? So it's the context. So I don't, it's not that Mary uh, and Zechariah are in competition for each other. It's just that one asked it with sincerity of faith. The other one responded sort of with um, uh, sarcastic or with an attitude and really a question. I mean, I wouldn't say a lack of faith, but he was pushing. And what happens to him? He's struck silent. Right, because for with six months, Mary, there is the response is, Thy will be done, right? Yes. So it's Zachariah. He didn't add that part. <laughs> Zachariah did not add it, even if he could speak, you know, because he could certainly physically make that, you know, uh, affirmative. So he was incredulous uh, about the whole thing and remained that way until, of course, uh, St. Elizabeth, of course, once she gave birth uh, to John the Baptist, his voice returned because he was able to name uh, uh, the son, John. And uh, so. You know, and then his uh, we we see the, the the end result. Of course, he probably you know, then of course he had his conversion. He understood you know what was going on here. But with Mary, she just wanted to see how this was all figure out. But in the end, her, her response is, "Thy will be done." And of course, that as Father Miller, a great Mariologist, would tell us, was not just a one time deal. It was her that expression, "Thy will be done," was through uh, the her whole her life, whole life yeah. at the foot of the cross, uh, even now in heaven. Uh, it's just an expression of who she is. So, uh, so that's how I think you should probably take the, the, the scriptural passage. So, anyways, that was very good, Priscilla. Thank you uh, for writing that one in. All right, we got someone from Jersey City here. Okay, so all the way out from Jersey City. Hello. Let's see here, <laughs> dear Father Brigetti, Father Tregilio, Father Marinelli. Love you guys. Keep up the good work. My cousin is a charismatic Catholic and claims to be able to pray in tongues. Is this a real phenomenon or is it psychosomatic? I remember hearing or reading that there is an official term for this, but someone said it only happened once at Pentecost with the apostles. What say you, Fred from Jersey City? Well, Fred, Father Tregilli and I and Father Marinelli also pray in tongues. Um, I pray in Latin and sometimes in Italian. So do you, right? Father Marinelli, definitely Spanish, and he gets a lot of compliments, you know, on his Spanish mass and all. Uh, so More than uh, I would. <laughs> uh, uh, but I know that's not where you're going with that. You're talking about the specific get. Now, the charismatic renewal uh, happened, I would say, in the mid-1960s, okay? Uh, and it was especially in response to a Protestant movement called Pentecostal. Uh, the Pentecostal started earlier, maybe around 1910 to 1920, and, um, and it was a very emotional type of religion um, in stark contrast to the old uh, 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 Protestant um, uh, standbys like, you know, the Lutherans and the Episcopalians and Presbyterians Methodist. and Methodists. Well, Methodists, too, were all also more emotional, too. Uh, but 
definitely those mainline or mainstream religions that we mentioned. So the Pentecostal then came in, uh, and they really tapped into what you had uh, put in the question, Fred, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And some of those gifts is being slain in the Spirit, so they would be overcome by the Holy Spirit and, and pass out. Others would be tongues, so they would speak this sort of like indescribable type of a language. It wouldn't be like Latin or Italian or Spanish that I had just mentioned earlier, but sort of like an indescribable language, but they were supposed to understand it. Yeah, someone um, would have the gift of interpreting tongues. And then you'd have that. So there's a whole list of, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you can look in the, in the sacred scriptures that are given. And um, now we possess all these gifts of the Holy Spirit in baptism and then renewed in confirmation. We may not be speaking in tongues, as so to speak, or or understanding them, but we have the other gifts that we're given, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, fortitude, knowledge, and uh, fear of the Lord, and counsel, and wisdom, etc. And um, so these are kind of more specific to the Pentecost uh, event, and that's why they called it Pentecostal. Now, the Charismatics came about in the 1960s, um, when um, the church was going through what they call a renewal, and there was a, a sort of a, a, a spark interest in the Holy Spirit. There were some problems, though, in the beginning. Um, they were becoming a little bit too Protestant in, in their theology. They were, you know, leaving out doctrine on Mary and and um, the sacraments, you know, and things of that nature. So Rome, so Rome had to come in and, and, and really uh, put a guard on them. Uh, we would have different communities. One was called People of Hope here in New Jersey. And um, the, the Rome had to say to the Archbishop of Newark, you know, bring them in line, which he did. And they are. And they're still in existence today. And they're doing very well. They uh, uh, are very, very uh, uh, Catholic in their, in their belief. But they still have the way they express themselves in the liturgy and, um, and in their own private devotional life, which... Um, if you've ever gone to a healing mass, not the anointing of the sick, but a charismatic healing mass, you'll often see the slain in the spirit type of thing, and sometimes even speaking in tongues too. Now, because you may not have it, or I may not have it, does that mean I'm not like on fire with the Holy Spirit? No. Certain gifts for certain people for certain uh, events. Yes, and the key word here is gift. A gift is right. not something you can demand Good or point. expect. So the fact that not everyone can, and, and there is, the technical term I think you were looking for was glossolalia. Uh, that's the I ability to speak I would have never thought about technical terms, so, <laughs> but I'm glad you think I was looking it's for it, It's another good scrabble <laughs> word, believe me. And uh, technically speaking, glossolalia refers to when the apostles themselves spoke languages that everyone could understand. In fact, they understood, they heard the language that, that was their native tongue. So Peter spoke in either Aramaic or, or Hebrew or whatever, or Greek, but people heard him in their native tongue. So a Roman soldier would hear him speak Latin. That was the gift of glossolalia. Now, in the charismatic movement, uh, this gift may be imparted to someone, and the gift of the, the uh, interpretation of tongues or the discernment of spirits, but being a gift, you cannot demand it. You can't conjure it up. So if you don't have it, doesn't mean that you're not close enough to the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you go to Steubenville, uh, there uh, the charismatic uh, Catholics are much more prominent than, than say, uh, over at um, uh, Christendom College, which tends to be a little bit more uh, traditional. But they're both Catholic. And uh, the charismatic uh, prayer groups, you know, are, are certainly sanctioned by the church as long as they keep within the confines. Which they have now. They're really very... Very. I mean, every good. diocese yeah. has an official charismatic uh, director. Right. And uh, as long as, like, for instance, the interpretation of Scripture, nothing wrong with that, as long as you conform to what the magisterium teaches. And that's what was one of the problems in the 70s. Yeah. That, that, that wasn't being, they were doing private interpretation, which was not according to the magisterium, and they were going a little bit off tangent. But once they were brought back in, so uh, remember, you have to look at it this way, spirituality in the Catholic Church is very broad, uh, and it encompasses everything. Or as a priest once said, we're a big church, we have room for everyone. So charismatic uh, renewal may not be your cup of tea, Fred, uh, but it may be for someone else. Uh, and you may not like the traditional uh, extraordinary right. form of the Mass either. Right. They're that all way. valid. Right. But th again, these are different spiritualities within the church that are valid. And uh, if they help you grow closer to the Lord, then you should use it. Um, 
also you know there i mean we, there's a broad spectrum of of devotional life in our church from from devotions to the saints to devotion to uh um uh, you know um processions and, and sacred uh, heart sacred heart and all the beautiful apparitions of our lady and and what have you uh so there there is a broad spectrum of that so charismatic is one part fully valid and uh under the guidance of the church and but it may not be something that you be called to and that's okay there might be something else there for you well thank you fred from jersey city and i hope that answered your question this one is for you, Father Tregilio, and um, pa, uh, dear Padre. Uh, now, I know being a Navy man, I was uh, chaplain in the Navy. When they call you Padre, it's a term of endearment. So this person is calling you a, ter- a term of endearment. <laughs> yeah. So dear Padre, okay. I love St. Magdalene more and more as you make it more and more Catholic, inch by inch. Oh, I actually know this person, too. Um, anyway, step by step, I would like to know if the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph ever had a discipline or correct Jesus as a child, since he was, like us in all things, but sin. In other words, did Jesus ever hear his parents say, no, since he was the eternal son of God? Curious George from South Amboy, and I do happen to know uh, Curious George, so okay, that's a great wow. question. Yeah, and it he just come he comes up all the way from South Amboy, okay. well, Parlin section, to to worship Mass here. So, well, uh, God bless you, George, for your long yeah. drive. Um, it is a good question. Now, obviously, we make the distinction that obviously Jesus never did or could sin because sin is going against the will of God, and since Jesus is a divine person, he couldn't go against his own will. But in his human nature, all right, even though uh, he has a divine personhood, he's got two natures, human and divine. His human nature, he learned how to speak, he learned how to walk, all right, so he wasn't some, you know, prodigy walking around, uh, you know, at, at two months old, he wasn't speaking, you know, as an infant, he learned how to speak, and that, and so I can see Mary and Joseph saying no to him, not in a disciplinary way, but, you know, it's in a teaching moment, Say yes, do this. No, don't do that. Uh, but Jesus would never have been disobedient. He would never have been uh, disrespectful. But he learned in human knowledge and wisdom. That's the key here. And part of your knowledge is being told or instructed yes and no. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're disciplining or correcting someone who's doing something bad. Someone who doesn't yet know that that's dangerous, you have to say to them no. It's like when a, a baby wants to stick a fork into the wall outlet, mommy has to say no. Junior isn't committing a sin, all right? He's doing something stupid, but he has to learn. So if Mary and Joseph said no to Jesus, it would purely have been a teaching moment. It would not have been any threat to his uh, That's a great sign of our blessed, our blessed Lord's humility that he would submit himself. Exactly, because he didn't have to. He, he could have, have to. pulled but on his showing the right person. He's showing us in a very tangible, teachable way about obedience to uh, legitimate authority, uh, humil- the virtue of humility, and that these are the high marks. Because humility um, is directly an opposite of the vice of pride, right? And obedience, opposite of disobedience. It's disobedience and pride that got us into this mess of original sin. And it is obedience and it's humility that is the way out of it. And so our blessed Lord, by doing this, is really giving us a tangible example in his life. And um, and so he submitted himself to these uh, uh, legitimate authority of his parents uh, to show us uh, about that. So, and sometimes hearing the word no is not a bad thing. Right. And with that, I have to say no to any more time, uh, but that is a bad thing. So <laughs> so we'll see you tomorrow. And uh, if you have any more questions, please send them in. There's an address that will be put up. Also, we are still in need of financial support for our Please. parish. Uh, you know, since the COVID happened, uh, our finances have really dwindled, and but yet we still have the employees and the bills and uh, the utility Their insurance and uh, uh, insurance for the parish, uh, property, etc. All the things that you have to go through, we do too, but on a larger scale. So we do count on your support. And there'll be, uh, Father Matthew will put up a whole thing on how you can do it. We really su- suggest if you can try to move to electronic giving, because that's a, a good security there. And there's a webinar, or there is a person you can talk to. Regina Edersheim. 
And Father Matt puts his her number too, so he's so you got no excuses <laughs> she's wait, out she's there. She's waiting for your so, call. So um, so give her a little uh, yes. ring on the on make the, her on the day telephone. and call her today. <laughs> so with that, let's give a blessing, Father. Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Until we see you next time, stay healthy and God bless you. Bye bye. bye.